Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Rodeo Time, the podcast. Got a good friend of mine, longtime friend. How long have we been friends? Man, that you don't know really hurts my feelings. 16 years. That's how long we've been friends. That's it. I didn't know. I was just going to let you. You were you were hesitating. I was trying to do the math. I was trying to, to buy myself some time. <laughs> uh, preacher man. Dale Brisby's preacher is in the house. Got a few questions we bring from Instagram. A few of our own we ask. Tell a few stories from the old days. Oh, yeah. The old days. Um, yeah. Uh, Jamin is pastor at Citizens Church in Plano, and he's going to answer some of the hard questions today. Um, about the Bible, about Jesus, about the world around us today. I love how you just pushed through that burp. Yeah. It was... I don't know if the mic caught my stomach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and we got some stories on each other. Uh-huh. We didn't share really in the podcast. Are there any we missed that we need to share in the intro? Oh, there's so many. Um, I'm just trying to filter... So. Have y'all heard me tell the story when we met the governor and the lieutenant yes, governor? Yes, and you poked. Uh, we had a buddy. Yeah, Brandon. I just there's one part of it I don't know. I'm coming, Lisa. Okay, cool. Um, we had a buddy. Have a buddy. His name is Brandon. He's got a sensitive neck. Let's go, Brandon. Yeah, Let's he's, go, he's, Brandon. he's 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 uh he's from South Texas. Mm-hmm. Very sensitive neck. And, um, like when you touch it like this, he makes that noise and he turns away from it. I don't know. Noise? Yeah. Like you, you touch him right there and he like gets away. It's like, it's like it gets, it gets under his skin. And he's just like, Oh, I can't take it. You yeah, know, like, like kind of like, yeah. kind of like when somebody runs their nails on a, on a chalkboard, yeah. Yeah. except if they were to just touch your neck, yeah. it's a button, man. And when you push it, it goes, <laughs> that noise goes off sometimes loud. Like, dude, he, if you caught him off guard and came up behind him and you're just like, maybe he's on the computer and you just touch him on the neck, like, well, he'll make that noise. Yeah. You know, I'm not exaggerating. So you guys are bullies. Well, I mean, we're his buddies. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Dude, yeah, he I would bet. get mad at some people, but for some reason, like, I was like this little he would brother. Never get mad at you. Little he buddy. never got mad he at me. You, so you told me the story about the pillow fight where you were like, whoop. Beating him with Do you remember his that at the La Quinta? I don't remember any of this. <laughs> Whatever. I don't, I don't remember meeting the governor. D- okay. Well, all right. All right. There's a couple of stories. <laughs> this is a long intro, everybody. Don't worry. It's it's just part of the podcast. <laughs> we were in the Robert Henson, and me, I was whooping on Brandon with this pillow. Me and him <laughs> were ha- having a pillow fight, and I was winning. <laughs> and Robert came in and like hit him one time, and he kind of hit him, and like we both hit him at the same time. Brandon fell off the bed, and he was like, dang it, Robert. You take it too far. We're trying to have a good time. You take it too far. And everybody was looking around because Robert did hardly anything. Yeah. But like I had been like hounding. And then I was like, yeah, Robert. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, Robert. me and Brandon were tight. Yeah. Anyways, the Lieutenant Governor, remember whenever Steven like set it up? I don't know. We, went, we went and met oh, the. so it wasn't even the governor. Well, we met the governor earlier uh, in the day. Who was governor? Rick Perry. Okay. Yep. And I don't remember. I'm not going to. Great, great. Remember, he was like reading my jacket, and he was like, "Are you?" Oh, we'll yeah, tell that story yeah, later. Yeah, yeah. But that night, we were at some cocktail party. Okay, and we were meeting the lieutenant governor, we were Dewhurst. All like Nineteen, Dewhurst. Okay, yeah. And um, me, you, and Brandon, we're standing in the back. There's ten of us, and we're it's like lieutenant governor, and it's like a it's kind of a black tie type oh, yeah. party. We're all wearing jackets and everything, and and like me, Brandon, Jamin, we're in the back, and Jamin had this like power over me. Like, it was like, he could, like, tell me to do something, and I'd be, like, all about it. You know, he'd be like, he was an instigator. And Instigate he's standing just as close to Brandon as I was, so I don't know why he didn't do this. Like, he didn't think to do it himself. But Brandon's standing in between us, and he, like, gets my attention. And, like, we're talking to the lieutenant governor, who some people think has more power than the governor. I don't know. I don't care. I mean, I do care, but, like, in that moment, like, whatever. Like, I just don't care who we'll treat everybody the same. And, but we're in like some fancy setting and Jamin gives me the look and just smiles. And I'm like, Oh yeah, I need to poke man in the neck. Push the button. I need to push the button. You know, it's like a, I don't know. Like I'm just that guy. I might let one rip at a funeral, you know, like here's I, how I remember it. You looked at me 
and you're like, now's the time. And I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. My little, <laughs> I'm just like. He's, he about. changes stories. On uh, yeah. <laughs> so I reach over and I give Brandon the business and he goes. <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant Governor's like mid sentence and everybody like, well. It's like the record scratch. The yeah. room goes quiet. Turn everyone turns. Around. Except our whole team. There's 10 of us and they all know exactly what happened. They know exactly who did it. And like Logan was the president, you know, and he was just like shaking his head. Did he? Give they you are some not words. amused. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they are not amused. So that night, it had like this candlelight. It's like this serious talk. Remember those? Do you remember this? <laughs> I must have blacked all of this out for protection. I so it was it's like a flashlight. Well, that's what it was. We didn't want to use candles. Oh, it was a flashlight. Okay. Whoever had the flashlight got to do the talking goes around and pretty much everybody just bashing on me like how i was just like inappropriate and like like we're in a professional setting and got this opportunity except for jamin jamin did it hey. i wonder why you did it <laughs> because you knew it was your idea he I felt bad for you. He <laughs> bashed on it. Just, 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 just. but and dale like yeah you can't be doing you this <laughs> At some point, you got to grow up, Dale. We're 19 now. We're what, teenagers. What did Brandon say? Uh, I don't remember. I he was this. he wasn't too yeah. hard on me. You know, like Brandon was, you know, yeah. he didn't like to. Well, Brandon Dang was it, Robert. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Robert's well, idea. Brandon was like, so, of course, when everybody looked, they looked at Brandon. You know, yeah. so he was kind of the victim yeah. of the deal. So <laughs> it was understandable that yeah, he was I a little more it. upset with me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I saw Brandon a couple of years ago. It's been a while, but. No, I didn't. I did it. Yeah. Oh, God, that's a good there. time. I can't believe you blacked those out. That was fun. They're gone. <laughs> They're gone. <laughs> Some of the things I remember. I just remember being excited that you backed me up. Always. Because I had kind of, in that moment, I had forgotten that it was your idea. Uh-huh. You know? Me too. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so we, 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 give, we go over a few little stories. Jamin is going to um, give us some... Uh, Give us some wisdom, really. So y'all check him out on Instagram, Jamin Roller. Check out his church, Citizens Church. Um, and then I'm sure somewhere on your Instagram you've tagged Matt Chandler. So <laughs> go follow Matt <laughs> Go follow Matt for the real word. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, Jamin and I have been buddies a long time. So I feel like the sponsor we need to recognize for this one is Jesus. Mm. Amen. Amen. We normally recognize sponsors, right? At this point, yeah. I was intro. wondering. I was wondering if we were, like, but Jesus, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. We're, we're not, we're not going to do any plugs. Yeah. Right here. We well, don't. The only it. plug we're going to do is the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Bingo. Amen. That Amen. plug. Amen. That's plug. that's who we're going to market today. Plug. And then this is where um, we're on to the podcast and we roll in the the intro music. Isn't that good intro music. That's good. Was your surgery? Um, I had surgery Wednesday. You're kidding? Yeah. In Dallas? Or no, I'm not kidding. Yeah, in Dallas. Huh? Yeah. What'd they have to do? Uh, put a plate and like several screws in. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just really get up in there. Are you hurting? No, I'm I'm off of pain meds. I only took pain meds for two days. I was kind of hurting then, but yeah, I, I'm better now. I. Uh, I'm still on Tylenol, but it, the the surgery it's not that bad. Yeah, okay. They didn't they didn't they didn't give me enough morphine when I was coming out of it. Mm. And uh, what hospital were you at? It was one of the Carroll clinics. Okay. There's there's like a big Carroll clinic, I think, a hospital, and then a smaller one. I was at the smaller one. You didn't call me. Yeah. Well, I should have called you. Yeah. Should have called. I you. was out of town. Yeah. Well, I knew that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what it was. <laughs> Um, this is great. What you been doing? Uh, we just went to on vacation to Jackson Hole, Wyoming. It's incredible. Man, I've heard a lot of people say they go there. It's What's it's incredible. It's um so, you know, mountains are great. The thing about the that's the Tetons. Yeah. And the thing about Jackson Hole is <clears throat> that whole landscape is it's plains, 
and then the mountains just kind of explode. And so yeah. it's really dramatic. Um, it's a it's a country town too, so it's yeah. it's a lot of rodeo and it's uh yeah it feels a lot of mountain towns kind of have that like I don't know uh it's like the outdoorsy maybe kind of hippie feel to it, but Jackson's like it's quaint it's rural yeah yeah it's nice. They have rodeo like every weekend there in the summer. They have like a summer series there. I'm pretty yeah. sure. I think you can turn him up a little and turn you up a little. Or you get closer to the mic. No, uh-uh. I turned him down because I'm, I'm hearing some buzzing. Okay, but you gotta get you gotta get louder. Okay, bingo. Check one two. Um, um, it is the richest county in America, seventh richest county in the world. Is that like per capita or just like gross? Gross. Wow. Yeah. More more concentration of billionaires than anywhere else in America. Isn't that crazy. I yeah. Did not know that. Because they, I guess like in the mid-90s, they uh, the government came in and called all of it a uh, national park. So you can't, so the, the it's like landlocked where you can actually own homes because you can't own in the national park. So everyone wants to live there, but there's such a such a shortage of like houses and stuff like that. So it's, um, yeah. So it's a little more expensive. So that's what it takes to move there. And the taxes in Wyoming, I think, in general... Are better. There's no state tax, just like in Texas. Yeah. So, yeah, I know. I've got one wealthy friend that says one day you'll move to Wyoming, which I don't know that I will. But I think one day you'll probably vacation there. It's real nice. Jackson Hole, put it on the list. Come on. Yeah. Um, tell us the 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 Jamin Roller story. Mm. Well, um, I was born. The same year my dad started pastoring a church. So I've been a preacher's kid my whole life. Yeah. And we uh, didn't move around a lot. He's only pastored three churches in his lifetime. So for the first 13 years of my life, we were in the Dallas area. Duncanville. Duncanville, Texas. Duncanville. <laughs> and um, yeah, those were those were good years, strange years in some ways. And then we moved down to, uh, when I was 13, moved down to Fairfield which is 90 miles south of Dallas, small country town. So I was going to, Duncanville at the time, it might still be, it was the largest high school in the state of Texas because they never wanted to split up their athletics. So they just kept building onto their high school. So they have this massive uh, campus, basically, like a college. In Duncanville? In Duncanville. In Duncanville. And so that's where I was. And then where I moved is I had 97 kids in my graduated class. So it was a pretty big culture shock. It was like city to country for sure. And then that's where I went to high school. And shortly after that, met you. Yeah. <laughs> right after you graduated high school. Matt, you? <laughs> I almost called you the wrong name. Um, and, uh, yeah, got married pretty young. I was 21 when I got married. Met Carrie around the same time that you and I met in 2005. Dang, you were 21. Mm-hmm. Got married at 21. She was 22, so. Dang. That's I, for, I forgot. I didn't realize that. Uh-huh. And uh, at the time, I didn't think that was young to get married. But now think, thinking it, I'm like, what were you doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, that's like you getting married, Willie. He'd been married for a year. Yeah, and you would be married year. for like four. Yeah, that'd be terrible. No, <laughs> no offense. <laughs> no offense. Can you oh, imagine man. being married right now? No, I can't at all. <laughs> and and, and and think about just the girls you've met up until a year that ago. It would have been one of those girls. That poor girl. <laughs> Whoever would have been that was married to me at 21. And now yeah, I, I would feel more sorry for them than me. Yeah. In that situation. <laughs> you were pretty mature as a 21 year old. Well, I don't know about that. Well, you made a good call on the girl you married. We made, yes. Yeah. God was really kind. Um, she was more mature than I was for sure. So I think she probably covered for me. She was a winner. Uh huh. Is a winner. Is. But I'm saying, like, having made that call at 21, like, that was a that was a good call. So I guess when you know, you know. Well, I don't know if you remember this, but for the first few years that we were dating, you kept trying to convince me that she's going to break up with me pretty soon. You're like, this just doesn't work out. It's like a girl like her and a guy like you. It's just it's yeah. just a matter of time. So. Dang. Yeah. It, was. I just, it just doesn't exist. I didn't, I didn't think. Yeah. Well, and my... Uh, I guess my rap sheet up to that was just like 
Dude, it's not supposed to be this easy, Jamin. <laughs> <laughs> You're not experiencing enough challenges, so there's there's just no way this is. I don't know. It's a fairy tale, is what I thought. Oh, yeah, but that was like most of our. That was like really what built our friendship was you helping me through women troubles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, there was you needed a lot of help. Yeah, a lot of help. <laughs> It gave you guys some really good material, though, to, like, keep the laughs rolling. Uh-huh. It did. Yeah. It did. And it helped us know th- how how good we were doing. <laughs> you know? It's like, oh, okay. That's the gauge. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, yeah, you got married 21. Got married 21. We had our first kid at 20, when I was 24. Asher. So, Asher. Yep. He is 10 now. Which is crazy. Golly. Yeah. He's in fifth grade. He's older than dance. He's oldest. Is he really? Yeah. Okay. Wow. So we, um, <clears throat> I, shortly after Carrie and I got, no, right before we got married, I went to Bible college in Dallas. Chris Will. Chris Will College. And I'd been <laughs> at Baylor and then transferred. Yeah, I tried to start. <laughs> Chris Will's great college, but there wasn't a whole lot of, I'd come out of, you know, a different college and definitely spent a lot of time because it carries at A&M. So A&M has all of the, you know, their own cheers and all that kind of stuff. And I yeah. went to Chriswell and none of that existed. So I tried to maybe start it, you know, with yeah. like some gang signs. Yes. <laughs> signs and some so cheers. I remember. And Chris, Chris I'm, Will. I'm like James Hype, man. I was going to okay. say, you seem like it. Like you. Duncan Bill. It was all I could did do you, not to say Fairfield. Did, yeah. Did you go there? Like, uh, <laughs> I did. I didn't go to Duncanville. I just remember like, so Jamin and I met in FFA, you know, oh, which yeah. is predominantly agriculture type kids. And he was living in Fairfield and, uh, which I saw your old ag teacher, um, uh, crap. Tommy. Uh, yeah. Neelan. Really? I, I saw Mr. Neelan the other day at a wedding, uh, completely random it wasn't you you don't even know the guy but he was just anyway it was good so we were talking about you and how you never answer the phone <laughs> um but anyway uh yeah so we met through the ffa which is like predominantly agriculture kids you saw it at indianapolis and jamin was in fairfield which is an agriculture town but he um had just fresh out of duncanville and so he was like this like <laughs> it never inner left. city yes inner city kid that was amongst all these ag kids. I and so always felt out of place, man. You were always felt and you were always place. making fun. And my, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Golly. It felt like for me, it was it was a, it felt like a, it just a short season, like a stint. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't gonna be. It's like I kind of knew I was always gonna get back to the city and all that. But, right. Um. Yeah. But married a country girl. I mean, Carrie grew up you know, raising animals and right. really successful at stock shows. Her dad's yeah. like a really well-known uh, guy in the sheep and goat world, I guess. Yeah. And, uh, and so it, but yes, it's like walking into that, even, even, even like talking about that part of the story about how much, cause it was FFA for like a whole, all of high school. And then, you know, we were off a year and yeah. traveled and it was every day. And that feels like, a different life, man. It's a long time ago. Yep. That's just like a normal day for me. Mm-hmm. It doesn't feel different at all looking mm. back. Like that was, but of course, you know, my old man was an ag teacher. Yeah. And so anyways. But I'm really grateful for it. Yeah. Super grateful for it. Changed me, shaped me. Yeah. Yeah. So uh you get out of Chris Will. And I I visited with him. So like I just remember like I went I almost went to Chris Will. Like Mm-hmm. Uh, like they they hit me up for a little while because like I would like sign the cards like yeah I want to hear more about it yeah because I remember your dad you said your dad he actually was a plumber uh-huh. and then he went to seminary because he just wanted to be a plumber who knew a lot about the Bible that's right and I was like man that's awesome mm-hmm. I want to be a cowboy that knows a lot about the Bible and so I'd always like threaten to take like night classes or uh-huh. something like online but I just I, I always felt like it would be something I wouldn't give my full attention to yeah. if I wasn't sitting in the classroom. And um <clears throat> especially when I went to a class with you, it was just it was good. It was really good. It was just deep. Mm-hmm. And it's not 
you know, when you go to seminary, it's not necessarily like if, if I were to take online classes through seminary, it, it's not like you're doing your Tuesday morning Bible study with your buddies. Mm-hmm. And if you didn't read up, if you didn't, you know, it's, it's not just like a normal, like you're, you're there to learn yep. about theology. Mm-hmm. It's not just like, hopefully I picked up on this one principle Paul is trying to teach. Right. You're in pretty deep. Right. And yep. you're paying money yep. and people are, there's expectations. And so that was why I never really, cause I was just, my you life can't really is, fail the Bible study with your buddies. Right. But you can, you can, you fail. can fail Bible college. You can fail Bible college. <laughs> it's yeah. different. Yeah. But <laughs> so from Chris, well, we went and I, my dad actually pastors in West Texas now. And so we went on staff there for three years. West T. West T. No. no. Oh, I, thought that was, I thought that was something. Yeah, no. Just wait. Uh, okay. <laughs> Just wait, Donnie. There will be another opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then moved back to the Dallas area and yeah. uh, been at the same church for uh, nine years now. In there. We Lots of changes and all that, but yeah. So now you got we, to, and how much time did you spend with Matt Chandler? Um, well, since I came on there, um, you know, nine years, known him for about that long. And yeah. Yeah. There's different seasons where you spend more time than than not. But. Was he pretty influential in your? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. As a pastor, so I started listening to Matt in, um, you know, <laughs> do y'all remember the 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 first like, uh, oh gosh, what was it even called? Ip- iPod. Yeah. Yeah, an iPod. iPod. The first iPod that came out was like the size of a shoebox, and uh, <laughs> I had a car. I was driving a 1987 yeah, Nissan Caprice. Sentra. No, 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 that was that was <laughs> <laughs> Caprice <laughs> class. The Caprice, yes, it's a blue, old blue. It was a boat, uh-huh. man. Yeah. Thing with, and I was <laughs> sleeping like a baby, and you hit me in the arm, only for me to look up and see the cop. He's like, "Hey, here's your seatbelt ticket." And I looked over at you. I was like, "You come wake me up." You can wake me up. Tell me I we got pulled all over. About that. That's when I learned that you <laughs> could that get car. a ticket uh, for even if you're not driving. Yeah. Did you know that, or did you well, learn that that day too? I don't remember. I don't remember if I knew that. <clears throat> he I mean, came to your side, and he's like, "You're not wearing your seatbelt." And I thought, "Oh, awesome! I'm not getting in trouble. It's just <laughs> I'm getting in trouble." Hey, also, I don't know out. if this has aired yet, but it's not live. Okay. It hasn't aired yet. No. No, 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 no. I know that this is not airing. <laughs> but I saw the thing that you posted about me punching the windshield. Well, we never said your name. Okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Great. I just... <laughs> I didn't think that that was the... I didn't think that that was a fair recounting of that. Oh, what yeah. What happened was the bird hits the windshield, and then there's a feather that's stuck to the windshield. Right. Right. But we don't. Nobody knew what happened to the bird. We don't know if he was dead. We don't know if if he was. What he what he might have done is he might have gone to get his buddies and come back <laughs> to your truck. And if that feather was there, then he would have known who right. hit him. Yeah. And so <laughs> I was trying to clear get all rid the, of evidence. the evidence. Yeah. And then you throw me under the bus. I, who knows how bad that could have gone had I not punched your windshield. You know, I never really thought about that. Yeah. Thank you. I was just like overcome with anger. <laughs> <laughs> so the caprice. <laughs> The yeah iPod Matt Chandler, and then you could get this. It didn't have a CD player; it just cassette. You could get a cassette that had a little wire attached to it that you then plugged yeah. in. Yeah, y'all, y'all remember this? Oh and yeah, play through my truck. And then play through the speakers, and so that was two thousand seven or eight. I think I started to listen. I would download his sermons <laughs> onto that iPod and then listen to him as I drive. Yeah. Because back in that time, I was coming to see you guys in College Station because yep. Carrie was finishing up there. And so that, and I was going to Baylor. Yeah, that's and right. So that, You'd come stay on my couch. Come stay on your couch. Yeah. That hour and a half ride back and forth. Yeah. Um, and so I started listening to him then, and, and that's when it was like, there was just, just like so many people when they when they hear his preaching, and it's just something, he's anointed, and he's got a gift, and um, yeah. Man, is it, so like, my church the church where I, you know, tied to and like is grace mm-hmm. down at college station. Still, mm-hmm. it's hard for me to get away from there. Mm. Obviously we can't, you know, it's five and a half hour drive. I don't drive back and forth, but you know, I'll listen online and I've been going to some churches around here and really it's been a long transition, but I still, anyway, m- my pastor down there is Brian 
Fisher, and he's the man, you know. How how do you guys handle keeping – I'm trying to word this, like, delicately, but, like, it's almost like churches, like, for instance, the village with Matt, my church with Grace. I'm sure it's probably already happened at Citizens with you, but, like, how do you handle, like, some of these pastors that just almost become, like – celebrities Mm -hmm. you know it's like and then all of a sudden the congregation like they get this or at least i feel like i get this deep connection with these pastors and it's not that i'll tune anybody else out there's some some pastors that you know like matt morton who will speak and i love listening to matt also but like it's like how do you avoid like those guys that just get it's just like people just want to hear from the main man or is that really a problem no i think there's a couple things it's like you know, uh, there's a gift to it. It's like God has given some guys and women a gift to, you know, uh, just that there's some way that he has wired them and given them a like a mantle. Like even think about back to Billy Graham when he, you know, his crusades are launching. And that's that's a different kind of way for someone to go viral than today. But he went, his preaching went viral, right, basically. Absolutely. and absolutely. Um, and, and it, God had given him that gift for that time and used it. And so there's a sense in which you, you know, as a pastor of a local church, when, you know, and I know there are people in my church who are listening to other voices that can say things better than I can say them and that know things that I don't know. It's like, I don't, I don't necessarily care that they're getting all of the truth from one place as long as what they're getting is, is truth. And so there's a, there's a sense in which I'm, I'm grateful for it. You know, right. the, the downside of it is, or the thing that to be careful of is when you actually attach to someone's personality and that's what it is that, right. that you, it's like you're, you're the thing that I worry about uh, or maybe would just caution people towards is when um, there is the attraction is actually to the messenger and not to the message. Right. If what you are being moved by is the fact that God's gifted that messenger to, to communicate that message in a certain way, then praise God. But if you can only hear from that one, or if if you you start to find yourself kind of more, I don't know, maybe more drawn to the the person, the personality, then it's the it's kind of the Christian version of you know fangirling over some celebrity, right. or it's the Christian version of. You know what we can, what can happen is is we can look at these celebrities and we can basically define our or, or it's like riding off the coattails of someone else's relationship with God. If you're only ever listening to some celebrity preacher, or if you're only ever just consuming, if your discipleship and following Jesus is just limited to you know watching whatever John you know Piper. soundbite or whatever that yes, then there's something that you are you're going to be malnourished because God wants you to spend time with him, you open your Bible, you pray your prayers to yeah. God, you read what he said, and you you take someone, you know, you cut out the middleman in a way, and and if that's not happening and you're only ever just consuming what some really well-known person is putting out, then, then there's going to be some ways in which I think you're hamstrung. Yeah. Yeah, I've, uh, yeah, I think, Dave, you you shared a sermon with me a long time ago. It pops up on my on my iPod occasionally, but it was a sermon. It was like David Nasser. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And he was talking about that. He was like, "It's not necessarily important that the truth is spoken through me, so long as the truth is spoken." Mm-hmm. You know, because he was going to a conference and they were talking about how many people had come to know the Lord already, mm-hmm. and like his immediate reaction was like, well, "Dang, how many? I got to speak. What's going to happen? You know, yeah. if they're all already." And it made him check up and be like, "Whoa, you know, it's not important that I'm the one that speaks it, just so long as it's spoken." Yeah. But I don't know. I uh, I've always been a fan. I've, he seems like he'd be going back to Matt. He seems like he would be like fun to hang out with outside of even just like a, a sermon type setting. Like, oh, he, he like, is who he is. He's the same guy off stage yeah. as he is on stage. He's does he give you a run for your money as far as like um, the wit? And oh, bro. Giving you he's, a hard time. <laughs> he is quick on the draw, man. Yeah, he is. Yeah. Jamin's pretty good at, at um, well, he's pretty witty. No, when I'm just quiet. If it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, 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 the thing I love most about him is he's most well known, obviously, for his preaching, but uh, he is a, 
uh, as good of a preacher as he as as incredible as a preacher he is. He's an even better pastor. He's a good man. Yeah. Yeah. Godly. So define the difference. Yeah, I was going to ask that. So um, you can be preaching is just all about knowing how to to uh, preaching is about a relationship between a speaker and an audience. Now, obviously, it's God's word, and you're wanting to be faithful to do God's word. But pastoring is about a relationship between uh, a, a, a shepherd and his people. And so you can be good on stage uh, and not be good in the living room. You can be good on stage and not be good in the hospital. You can be good on stage and not be good, you know, counseling a couple in your office. And it's for especially because of that so part of even the like the whole idea of a celebrity I feel like that would if you had to pick one being important it would probably be the the pastoring be yes. the most important yes in in fact uh the good preaching should be an extension of faithful pastoring right so um but even just the the reason why like a celebrity preacher can exist is because we live in a culture that right now the the thing that's most true about our are about the the world that we live in is is that it is uh consumer driven and celebrity oriented right that's how so much of commercials work you get a famous person you appeal to you know people's desire to be like them and then you also you know appeal to some sort of desire that's in them to have more right to consume more so it's consumer driven celebrity oriented and so what's really dangerous in the religious world in the church world is to just run that play right that you build churches for consumers and then you try to get a celebrity or a personality that's growing to be entertaining and basically you just turn church into a business but church isn't a business church is and, and church isn't centered around a celebrity it's centered around Jesus the greatest you know, human that ever lived and our king and savior. And so ideally uh, in the, the design is that for Jesus to be the draw that Jesus, like I'll, I'll tell our church this often that, you know, the, the greatest thing that we have going on here at our church is not a program. It's a person. It's the presence of the risen Jesus who we believe is with us. Like he promised at the end of Matthew's gospel or with you always, even at the end of the age. And so there's a, there's a danger in our culture, especially in like a Bible Belt culture, there's a danger that that you're just trying to put on a religious version of corporate America or you're trying to put on a religious version of, you know, some sort of, you know, appealing to those who want to re- consume religious goods. And in that environment, you can have someone who just cares about putting on a good show and just cares about giving a good talk about the Bible and adding in humor and story and working it in such a way that, you know, everyone kind of leaves thinking, man, I had a really good time. That's where you can, that's where you can just be a a preacher. You could just be someone who gives a talk, but the work of actual pastoring is a lot um, messier than that. It requires getting on the ground. It requires spending time <laughs> knowing people. It requires opening yourself up to be hurt and to be vulnerable in ways. So, um, man, that's so. It's it's neat to think. You know, I feel like that's been a principle in your life for a long time. Just because, like, thinking back to the early videos, you know, that I made, I feel like, um, you know, the way I came about doing what I do was it's it's easy for me to give God glory. You know, I'd, I'd, yeah. I'd always thought about um, when I was rodeoing, I was, I was wondering, like, how do I give God glory for this ride that went well to someone who's maybe a non-believer? Mm-hmm. You know, because they saw me make the ride. Because mm-hmm. when I say, well, I give God all the glory, like, that's great. But how does it translate for someone who may not believe in God? Right. Well, with my story and the way that everything's happened with with the YouTube channel and everything, like when I get deep into my story, it's undeniable that God had a hand in my journey. Mm-hmm. Like, and uh, and I just I feel like it's I love talking about it even to a non-believer just because like it's so easy for me to give God the glory. Um. So, anyways. I always 
go back to those early videos, well, just what I mean by that is just how rodeo played a part in my life, how FFA played a part in my life, my old man, um, the people that are involved with the company side of things, like for instance, Payton mm-hmm. being my roommate now he, in college. Now he's my, my, my lawyer, um, Lisa, who manages the warehouse, like all these things came together. It's just like, you know, I didn't plan this. Yeah. Yeah. And so even like me being a class clown, you know, whenever we were poking Brandon in the neck <laughs> in front of the Lieutenant governor and, you know, like that was just in my DNA to be that guy. And yeah. now all of a sudden that's what it is now. Well, early on I was like, this isn't necessarily orchestrated for me to just be a preacher right. on social media. Right. And so I came to you and I was just like, because anytime I go to a rodeo, like I was known, like I'm going to have a word. Mm-hmm. I'm going to a rodeo. We're going to, I'm going to just a quick word before I'm going to pray before. And you know, like that was like the, like if I might as well not even go to the rodeo if I wasn't going to do that. And so I had that knee jerk reaction with these videos and with social media, like how do I, and you made a you made an observation, you know, and I'm kind of paraphrasing. I don't I, I remember the conversation, but essentially it was like, you know, like trust where God put you and know that a lot of your your ministry might be one on one. Yeah. You know, like off camera. Yeah. People that meet you in the booth, you know, people that you work with, people that you run into along the way. Um definitely not an excuse to just make the videos whatever we wanted. Sure. But I've always tried to respect the fact that God put me where I am as a comedian, you know, and um, and again, there, there's going to be like I'm going to go with my gut. If there comes a point and I, I'm put on and I'm waiting on the moment, you know, like I get put on a platform where it's like, hey, I need to say this, and it is very direct yeah. about what I believe. Like I'm not afraid of that. And if I get canceled or when I get canceled, so be it. Like I don't care about that. I'm just saying, like in general, in my day to day planning of how we're gonna make videos, like, anyways, and and that to me has always been way more important than and and you know going even to the the behind the shoots, like if I wasn't living out what I was talking about, then then what I said behind the shoots with the Bible open was worthless anyway. Right. You know. Right. And which is makes sense, like. It's great if you can deliver a good sermon, you know, but, but matter of fact, I went and talked to some kids, some state officers at the Dallas state fair. Remember that deal we went to? Well, I did St. Warren Mayberry called me and I went and, and I told them and, you know, they were starting off their state officer year and they were, and it was a Q and a, one of them asked me something. I was like, man, it just, it does not matter what you stay on, say on stage. Mm. Like nobody cares. It's great if you can deliver a good message, but nobody cares. Yeah. You got to, you, it's how you treat them off stage, how you live your life. Like that's the real sermon. Right. And, um, what you say does matter. Right. I'm not saying it doesn't matter, but how you live, I think matters more. But anyway, it's interesting to hear you say that just cause like, that's like a fundamental of mine, you know, but <clears throat> Willie may argue that I don't treat him kindly off camera you're just so art so easy to give a hard time to well i kind of getting what i deserve because i've always been the same way with other people so i can't really argue against it too much yeah that was a very humble thing to say willie, willie is he's actually really he's actually really good to me <laughs> willie's pretty humble he's he's sometimes he's hard to give a hard time to because he'll answer like that what are you looking at me for i was just looking at her Looking over at my little buddy Donnie. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. America's ginger. America's ginger. Yeah. Oh, you guys are so humble and kind. <laughs> Good people. And then like yesterday, I was over at Miss Lisa's house, and like her one kid has like these little baby carts, <laughs> and I filled up the baby cart with baby groceries. Oh, those little toys <laughs> over at her house. Yeah. And I said, "Hey, bro, <laughs> you forgot your grocery cart." <laughs> and I added Donnie. <laughs> <on it>. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, I think he knows that. Like, in the end, I watch his dogs the whole the whole week. Like, if he needs something, I'm gonna help him out because right. he's always there for me. So yeah, he's a good guy too. Yeah, you're just hard not to give a hard time to, Donnie. Oh yeah, yeah, because you're redheaded. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, man, we don't ever talk about this, but since I don't know, I'm gonna talk about what. What was it like pastoring a church in 2020? Oh, man. 
and still in 2021. Yeah. Uh, it was a lot of things. It was, it was very difficult. I think, um, you know, what, what was like a, what was like a core principle? Some of the core things that just got y'all through every day. Well, we, I mean, our church is incredible. Our people are incredible. There's a, you know, our church had gone through, um, a lot of difficulties before 2020 and and even we had, you know, we'd been a part of the village. And then in 2019, we had, we had uh, been sent by the village to become our own church. And so that was just major change and transition, you know, and um, during change, people make changes. And during um, it's like you almost force a little bit of crisis. Um, Maybe that's too strong a word, but you force change. And then in that, a lot of people make change. And so, and then there were other things that just happened in that season. So the people that were that were there with us when 2020 started and, and the pandemic started and all that, we'd already been, I feel like, kind of refined and brought closer together in a lot of ways. But even still, it's just, you know, you, you as a pastor, you get, uh, you're just on your heels, I felt, in all of it, because it's, uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a doctor, I'm not an epidemiologist, you know, uh, and then all of the political stuff that's tied up in all of it. It's like, I'm not a sociologist. I'm not, I, I, I barely know enough about, uh, being a pastor, much less know enough about how to, you know, understand all of the things that people got caught up in. So really what we tried to lead in was just, um, that there is unity in, uh, in so much as Christians, there's unity in what we believe about Jesus. There's unity in what we believe about the Bible, and that unity is strong enough to carry us through the things that we that we disagree on, you know. And so, there, there, it it felt like there was this external pressure to rally together around people who uh, uh, who believe about masks the same thing, or believe about the vaccine the same thing, or believe about you know, the election, the same thing. And you need to find your tribe and then, and then you demonize those who disagree with you. And it's just not, that's just not the way of Jesus. I I thought so often when Jesus puts his, his initial, you know, crew of disciples together, he pulls from all different spectrums of society. So you've got the Bible calls, the gospels calls Simon a zealot. And, uh, and then we know that Matthew is a tax collector. And so a zealot and a tax collector were like far left and far right in terms of if you think about what they believed to be the political way forward you know you ask a zealot that and it's going to be you know through war through combat through overthrowing the roman empire well a tax collector is someone who is basically benefiting off of the occupation that the roman empire has of that local land so those two guys could i mean you take you take you take two polar opposites right now on any issue and you maybe begin to get a feel for how different those two guys thought. And yet they spend three years together and then beyond that. And what was it that brought them together? Well, it was Jesus. They had a shared love for Jesus, a yeah. shared belief that he was the hope of the world. And if that is the kind of um, if that is the kind of effect that a love for Jesus had then, then then we're holding out hope that it could have that kind of effect now. I don't I don't want to pull together a, a people who agree on everything politically or who agree on every, you know, kind of thing that, that divides everyone else. It's like one of the marks I think of health for us now is that you can look around the room at our church and you can see people who fall in different places on different things, but they can maintain not just love, but actually friendship, actually like each other yeah. because we have this shared uh, salvation and love. And you know. again, just, the similarities, like here I am getting along with the redhead. <laughs> Why you gotta ruin his message? <laughs> like this guy's over here <laughs> saying, like I'm trying to pat myself on the back. Yeah. You've been here two and a half years. <laughs> hey, Dale's been doing that. The last I came to this area and did an event, I was preaching uh, for high school students. And yeah, Graham. It was What's that deal called? Fields of Faith. Fields of Faith at Graham. And it was. Uh, I just preach the gospel, you know, sin, Jesus, death, resurrection, repentance, faith. And I uh, give the invitation. That was part of the event that they, you know, the people hosting it wanted me to invite anyone who wanted to, to, 
to say yes to Jesus, to come down to the field. And so I give the invitation and, um, you know, a handful of kids kind of come down to the field and I look, they're still playing music. People are praying and I look and there is a line of kids standing there waiting to talk to Dale Brisby <laughs> and he's signing t-shirts <laughs> and he's talking. And hey, but I wasn't selling them. You weren't selling them, but there's this line of kids. And I'm telling you, there are more kids in line waiting to talk to Dale than there were kids praying to receive Jesus. And so I went home that night and Carrie, my wife, she said, Hey, how was it? And I said, you know, it was great. A lot of kids asked Dale Brisby into their heart tonight. So. <laughs> <laughs> he said, "Man, why got ruined his message?" Uh-huh. <laughs> he, he went there quick. Is this where you want to be? Been, you've been Is salty where, about uh, that yeah. for a few years. Is this where you want to be when Jesus comes back? Picking on poor little Donnie. <sighs> Don't be mad because my hair is so much better than yours, Donnie. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. what you got on me in life, then. All right, little buddy. <laughs> what? Um, <clears throat> What's the story that stands out about me and you? That one. Yeah, I was going to say, one. that's a pretty that good one. Well, that <laughs> one. <laughs> What's second? Oh, man. I think of that summer when I had no idea what I was doing, and you and your dad hired me to help with the Rough Stock Company. And I think I probably only lasted maybe three weeks. Um, but I think about those three weeks all the time. We had so much fun. It was so crazy. I remember there was this one time we were riding horses out at y'all's old place by Memphis, and... Um, you just jumped off your horse and start stomping on the ground. And I'm like, what is he doing? And I, and I ride up and there's this dead rattlesnake under your boot. You had just jumped off their horse and, and I am terrified of snakes. And I just thought, okay, that's that, if that's what this is about, then I'm not going to, I'm not going to make it very long. <laughs> the other one is we're at that rodeo in, I think it was Childress and someone didn't show up, and so uh, you needed one more person to do cowboy protection. Not the not the guy who dresses up in the clown, but the more I talk, the more everyone's going to realize how much I how little I know about rodeoing. But I, your dad told me to get out there and shoot the gap. He's like, when he gets <laughs> when the when he gets bucked off, and I'm like, from what? Like, and he's like, yeah. So they're this guy's on a bull. And I'm out there. Maybe Logan was out there, too. Do you remember this? No, not oh, specifically. Man. And I'm terrified. I'm just terrified. I didn't I didn't even own a pair of cowboy boots. Your dad gave me my first cowboy hat of her own. And uh, I'm out there in probably, like, New Balance tennis shoes or something like that and and uh, and probably, like, some uh, jean shorts or something. <laughs> and this guy gets bucked off, and I just tried to go help and do whatever, so I run – in between him and the bull and then I fall down and this bull he puts his uh head into the back of my neck and just drives me into the dirt and and I thought I was just I thought I was dead I thought for sure I was dead (laughs) and I thought if he doesn't kill me then a snake's gonna come finish me off or something right so I I uh, jump up and ran out of there and I was like I'm not I'm not doing that again but that same rodeo do you remember that you had that bull that you used to fight called Hector Hector yep I was supposed to get him. Your dad told me to get him. He he had I think you had fought him and then he ran out of the um arena into the shoots or whatever and your dad was like get him back into the pen and so I walk up and I try to start waving him and he just charges at me. And I'm like I'm not I'm not doing that. So he's still in the he's still in the thing and um they'd started bull riding again and your dad was trying to help someone. It might have even been your brother. And this bull uh bucks in the shoot and your dad's arm gets caught, and he breaks his forearm. His arm's, like, hanging there. Do you remember this? Yeah. And um, and so your dad is hurt. His arm's broken. He walks down the alleyway. He's about to walk to his truck to drive himself to the – and I never got Hector into the, into the pen. And so he, the Hector's right there. I'm on the gate, like hanging on the gate, just watching it all happen. Your dad's arms broken. Hector comes running at him and your dad just screams at him. And I won't say what he said, but he just screams at this bull and then tells him <laughs> to get out of here. And I promise you that bull stopped, turn around and just trotted into the pen. 
and close the gate. <laughs> and I just thought that. I haven't heard that story in a long time. This is a different world. I do remember that. Man. I do remember that because Logan told it shortly after. Yeah, like he was a different man too. Uh-huh. <laughs> I remember you were talking about like Did kinda, Logan tell it when he was here? No. Okay. Logan's been telling my stories for a long time. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jamin did the sermon at my dad's funeral. <laughs> it was, you know, like, you can imagine, like, my dad, like, you can imagine, like, the crowd, you know, like, there's some sure enough cowboys and some hard asses, you know, and some some sure enough real cowboy. And it, it was perfect because Jamin – got to talk to a lot of these guys about Christ and, you know, use my dad. And it was pretty heavy because you, whenever you said, there's a lot of you out here right now that, that was praying for, Mm -hmm. that was heavy. And I was like, man, number one, it's true. Yeah. And number two, they just heard it at his funeral. Yeah. Like that was heavy. Yeah. And, and anyways, um, but you held up that cowboy hat. Mm -hmm. So my dad had given him a cowboy hat that had the same size head and when my dad gave it to him, probably 10 years before at the time, yeah, it was a cowboy hat. Well, in those 10 years, it had become Jamin's like river hat. <laughs> <laughs> so like, imagine going to Bucky's right before you, you go to the Guadalupe and there's a Toby Keith like, wow. like that's what this hat looked like by the time <laughs> Yeah. And he held it up. And I don't remember if I said it or not. I might have spoken, but like, I remember thinking it. I, I might have said it, but I think I did say it. But I was like, by the way, that hat did not look like that when my dad <laughs> gave it to him. <laughs> it's like, that was not representative of <laughs> the kind of cowboy hat. My, it was no offense to Jamin. And Jamin didn't take any offense by it because he had obviously not like. Oh, I, I had no idea. Fancied yeah. himself a cowboy uh-huh. after he left, you know, Coke Tall Rodeo. Anyways, golly. Yeah. Well, no, I, and and it it it's awesome that you still have it. Um, one thing we did was a little bit of Q and A. I'd be remiss if I don't let you know if we don't answer some of these. There has been a fly <clears throat> Dude, just this, trying to ruin your day for the last 40 he's, minutes. He's doing a great job. He's really trying hard. It's probably a red hen. <laughs> probably a red hair, <laughs> red-haired fly. America's ginger. How do you navigate the path of being a light for others when in a van of bull riders? Oh, you'd have to answer that one. Man. So, I mean, just like what? Jamin was just talking about, like, well, I've always felt like, you know, rodeo was my mission field, Mm -hmm. you know. I'm not saying I would never go overseas, but I've felt like this, it's kind of a a niche industry, and I love rodeo because we go behind the shoots, and, like, you have something in common with that person. It's the same reason why I love doing, like, what we do with rodeo time. Like, we go to a booth, we go to a rodeo, and automatically, if there's six people behind the shoots, whether I know them or don't, like we got some commonalities and we can, there's there's some, you know, we've already broken the ice. I can go over, hey, what are you getting on tonight? Like whatever, you know, we're having a conversation and we're friends all of a sudden. And so like, it's a really neat way, like we've already done the hard work of starting a conversation. And so from that point on, it's like whether you minister to them by words or the way you live as you interact with them over that summer, you know, when you see them again down the road, like, you know, you get to minister to them. And so number one, I'd be grateful that, you know, God's put you there. You've got a, you've got a ministry with those gentlemen, but then it's, it's all about just remembering that like, yeah, how you live is even more important than how you talk to them. Yeah. And I think the, the idea of being a light, usually we, um, we think only in short term, like maybe the heart behind the question is what if, or a lot of times the, the thing that I'll feel or, or what I know a lot of people, um, maybe feel, uh, like they don't have enough answers or what if I get asked a question I don't know the answer to, or, you know, am I, when am I supposed to say something and not supposed to say something? So how do I navigate like being a light when, 
um, in a dark place, or even if people aren't going to appreciate that, I think that that the reality is is it's a long game. You know, it's not it's not about the one one hour period. It's not about you know necessarily offering the one right answer to the question at the right time, but just letting your life uh, and letting the difference that exists in you. It's what we talked about. I think who you are just matters so much more than what you do and your your character. Um, the little things that people see. I, I just think people observe a lot more than maybe what they let on. And so just to to have, you know, not not just a one or two hour maybe view, but to have like a one to two to five year view of what if I let my life be on display in front of this group of people for a long period of time and just trust God with what he's going to do with that and not, not feel the pressure of having to to have it all figured out. Um. Well, I can just remember this when it was asked a couple of times. What does it take to be saved? Go mm. to heaven. What does it take to go to heaven? The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. So it is... Romans, Romans uh, 10. Romans 10. 9 and 10. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Isn't it? I hope so. Yeah, I think that sounds so. good. It yeah. sounds real good. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the Bible. Um, I think that the good news of the gospel, um, I think what's true about every every single human, if, if we had enough time to just talk about life and hopes, and I think there's two things that, that every human has in common, that they want to live a life of meaning, that they really want their life to matter. And then the other thing is everyone has a sense that who they are uh, is not who they should be. And that comes out of people in all different kinds of, of, of different ways. Some people mask that with anger. Some people try to pretend like they're better than they are. Some people get really down on themselves and, and are unkind to themselves. But uh, those two, that desire for meaning and then that tension that we all know that who we are is not who we should be, the, both of those things are settled in the cross of Jesus Christ, that Jesus dies in my place. He raises again in victory over sin and death, and he covers the gap between who I am and who I should be, and he covers it with his own perfect life. There was never a gap between who Jesus was and who he should be. Jesus always was exactly who he should be, Man, exactly that's a good who way we should it. be. And uh, he covers our own failure. He covers our own inability uh, to be who we know that we should be with his love and with his forgiveness. And that allows us to live that life of meaning where we're not trying to overcome our insecurities. We're not trying to, in our own selves, overcome our failures, but we can live out of the, the identity gifted to us in Jesus that as we are, we are loved, and as we are, we are accepted, and he's given us different gifts. I think it's it's why this and the company that you've built matters is that, you know, obviously it's fun and obviously it's entertaining, but there's something deeper behind it for you and always has been something deeper behind it for you. And it's God, I just want this. You've always been so open handed with this. God, take it, God, grow it, God, shrink it, whatever you want to do with it, as long as uh, it's it, it's going to bring glory and honor to you. Um, so, yeah, I think what I would say is I think that that um, and Christianity for a lot of people, they only think of Christianity as. It's uh, it's an afterlife religion, right? Like it's about going to heaven when you die, and uh, it's there is truth that there is hope after death because of Jesus. But it's also so much more than that. It's it's also about teaching you how to live while you're still alive, and live in a meaningful way while you're still alive. So yeah, I took a, I had room for one more class in college, and it was the closest thing to anything religious that I took in in college, and it was just. It was kind of a, it's a non-bias. They were just kind of assessing each religion. And um, we went through dozens and dozens. And some, I'd, obviously, some I'd never heard of. There's so many religions out there. And the way they broke down each religion was uh, was interesting. You know, it's be like, these are the main principles. Um, this might, maybe what they believe about marriage I can't remember the different, but the, the one of the last ones was, this is what this religion believes in how to go to heaven. Mm. You know, how to make it to their afterlife. Right. And a path to salvation. And, um, man, it was just so many of them. In, in my mind, because I was trying to look at this through 
someone who was not raised in the church. You know, like my dad was a huge proponent of like where my faith is today. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to look at this. It's like you just you've never heard of it. You plop down into this book and it's like how do I decide what is truth and what is not and so that's what I was trying to look at through the lens of and in my mind it's like you're you're, you're trying to make it to this perfect place so you need to be this perfect person and all these religions have some sort of works attached to their path to salvation you know and where Christianity it just made sense like to me it just it was a neat moment hearing a professor who didn't claim to be any one of these religions talk about it. Like it still made sense, you know, in my mind, Christianity made the most sense because if I'm going to make it to this perfect place and I'm an imperfect being, which is obvious, you know, and, and should be obvious that all of us are. And even according to Romans three twenty three, we all are that I would need some sort of, um, something to stand in my place. Yeah. You know. Or it's like even Jesus, if even if you're that not gap. there even if you're not in a place where you're like okay, I'm I'm really sure that Christianity is right. If you just look at kind of the spectrum of the options, it's like which one do you want to be true? And if you're honest and you know the only uh good news, uh, the only um religion if if you want to use that word that that offers uh, that kind of meeting of both of those human needs. Like I want a meaning that can't be taken away. And then also I, I need these failures and sins that I know exist in me to be covered. The, the one that I want to be true is, yeah, there's a perfect God who sent his son in love to stand in your place, to show us how to live this life, to become more truly and fully human. And he's going to cover our path with grace and forgiveness and love all the way. It's like, yeah, sign sign me up for that. Man, I, you talk about like, I actually asked you is uh, uh, the um, Steve Jobs biography. Yeah, I was I was about to read it and I was like, man, what do you think? This guy's obviously not a Christian. Should I be reading books like this? And you were like, well, you said it, it. Well, it's a biography. I mean, it's like he he. Yeah, he might believe these certain things, but he also created the podcast, which is where, or the, the whatever it was, I can't remember what you said, but it was like something in Apple where it allowed people to listen to, you know, like God used him. Yes, right. And uh, so anyways, I, I listened to it, and it was less about his view on business and more about just his life, you know, yeah. which is, you know, essentially what biographies are come to find out (laughs) and uh (laughs) anyways it's like on his deathbed yeah he's still trying to figure out which religion yeah and like i mean one of the last few pages it says i i think all these religions are different doors to the same house Mm. or at least i hope so Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and lecrae has this one song i think it's even called truth and he just like breaks it down he's just like I think it's secular humanism that talks about how like your truth, your truth is true for you. My truth is true for me. Right. And then Lecrae's like, well, what if my truth says your truth is a lie? Mm -hmm. Like logically, one of us is wrong. Just logically. Mm -hmm. Not even because scripture says that's wrong, but just because it just can't exist, you know? And, uh, I always get so sad thinking of Steve Jobs, thinking Mm -hmm. that on his, on his deathbed that, because literally you're talking about like there are different doors saying like, Hey, that door doesn't exist, you know, and, and, um, having to navigate that. Um, and again, that's me going down the, the road. I'm trying to think like, how, what, what might this non-believer be going through and how can I help him rationalize this as to why I think he should believe what I believe? Sure. Cause one of my buddies, we were driving home from rodeo. He was like, man, how are you going to tell that person who maybe he's a suicide bomber? And he believes that that is his path to heaven. Like, hey, like he believes that. Like, he's going to pull that trigger. Like, how do you tell that person he's wrong? Like, how can, and, and I just, my answer was like, look, you can tell that, you can tell this person right here that gravity doesn't exist, but if he jumps off of a 10-story building, he's going to hit the ground. Mm-hmm. Like, just because he believes it doesn't exist doesn't mean that it, that just because you believe in something, that doesn't make it exist. It's got to exist first. Yeah. And, uh. 
anyway, I just took you through like my whole roller coaster of like how I would start the conversation. Mm-hmm. I can't imagine having to have those conversations on a mission trip. Right. Like you got to talk, you got to talk to people almost like, is it, isn't it like that? Well, I think, yeah, I mean, there are some settings where it's like that. I think the, the thing that. Cause they're going to say, why? Like, I don't think, right. I mean, it's like, I don't, I don't think what this book says. I've not ever read this book. Right. Tell me why I should open the book. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, there is not one, there's not a recipe You know, it's like people are complicated. People believe different things for different reasons. I think where I, just in my own life, where I lean is less towards how do I have this one conversation and more towards how do I cultivate long-lasting relationships with people who disagree with me on things and in hopes that both, not that, in hopes that God provides uh, multiple conversations, not just one. Right. Um, Because I think that there was a day when, in, in its long past where, you know, you could kind of go up to someone and there is enough shared belief to where you could start a conversation and who knows, maybe in five minutes, you know, you've moved the needle pretty far. And I just, I think that things, especially with social media and the news and it's like, um, you know, Christian means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And what Christians believe um, is I think the, especially now when, um, You've got just the public dialogue that is just so toxic and just so filled with a bunch of different divisive issues. It's like for most people, they feel like if to, in order to share their faith, they have to be able to, you know, give an argument for all of these different kinds of things. And I just think there's something about, you know, making space for relationships and making space for I'm going to love this person. I'm going to put my life on display for this person. And then when God opens conversations, I'm going to try to be as faithful in them as I can. But. Yeah, I I just wouldn't put the pressure of being able to go up and in ninety seconds have the yeah have all the right things to say yeah. But I think there are some to your point when you just talked about how it was illogical. It's like there's some ways to level the playing field when someone says something like "I believe my truth is my truth and your truth is your truth." The question you have to ask is, is that true? That's a truth statement, right? And that's an absolute truth statement. The idea that you. Uh, you know, in in philosophy or in in logic, it's called a um, it's called a self refuting claim. So the claim that there is no absolute truth. Well, the question you have to ask is: Is that statement absolutely true? Right. <laughs> because if it's not, then it doesn't matter. It's self refuting. It, it's a it's a statement that can't actually live up to its own terms. So, I think one of the things that is important is a lot of times people think that you know Christians or religious people they believe what they believe on faith, and then maybe. Uh, non-religious people, they believe what they believe on evidence. And it's like every single person, their starting place is faith. Their starting place is they agree to certain propositions that you cannot prove, like, uh, just with evidence. So that I think that is the place in the conversation which could actually be helpful to just say. It's not, we're all kind of doing the same thing here, that we're all starting from a place of believing things that we actually can't prove, the question then is, of those things that we believe, which ones actually most correspond with our reality? And I think that's Christianity. Christian, how do I make sense of the of the deep, you know, suffering around us? Right. Where right. you find that out in the <clears throat> Christian story? How do I make sense of the, you know, the deep love I feel for my wife and my and my kids? And it's because they're not, you know, they're not just organisms that have certain neurons firing in their brain, but they were made in the image of God, and we belong to this story that is filled with. You know, love and justice and heartache and all that. Man, it's crazy you said that. That same song where Lecrae, he talks about, like, if God exists, then how can the, how can all this evil exist? You know, how can, like, and, and one of the questions in this Q&A deal is, like, how can kids hurt? And it's like you can't have your cake and eat it, too. Mm. It's like if if God eliminated all evil, then we would all be eliminated. Right. Because even, a, even, an, even an evil thought is evil. So where, where do you want to draw the line? Because everybody's going to draw it in a different place. Right. You know, there's going to be lines drawn. And, you know, there's obvious lines that, you know, everybody draws mm-hmm. when it comes to like, hurting kids. But it's just, like, where there there's this evil that exists, but there's a good God that can help 
you know, rectify that evil. But it, it, he's just got to be called upon anyway. Like the what fact the that question? how can God exist if this evil exists? That's the question. For instance, like you know, there's a uh, an innocent kid that, yeah. for instance, maybe have cancer. Yeah. Um. Or or like a, a war that goes on and innocent people die and stuff like that. Just this evil in the world. You know, if God exists, how come He lets all this evil exist? Right. And Lecrae's answer was, well, it's 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 not that simple. It's like if he just eliminated all evil, then there wouldn't even be a world. And there wouldn't, you know, none of us would even exist. And so anyway, um, that doesn't necessarily solve the problem at hand, but <laughs> we should have had Lecrae on. Yeah. Well, he didn't answer, so I called you. <laughs> He didn't answer, so I called you. You kind of touched on it. This one's kind of deep, and we definitely don't have enough time in the podcast to answer it. But this person says, predestination or free will? Oh, man. <laughs> you were hoping I wouldn't ask that? Um, <laughs> both. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, both. Sorry, I'm getting a phone call. I'm trying to ignore it. Is it Lecrae? It might have been. Maybe I should answer it. All right, we're going to wrap up this podcast. we got Lecrae coming on. Um yeah, I've been. That's when I when I said John Piper earlier. That's really what I've been listening to. Is him talk about predestination versus free will and John to, Piper? Yeah. Oh, so you asked the question? No. This this is a. It says. I don't want to say who asked it, but. Um, I can verify. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I've been trying to answer the question too. Yeah. Really, more just justify the answer that my knee jerk reaction comes well, what to. most people do is is they um they play like you know bible ping pong with that is it's like they'll find a verse that's like really seems to kind of shut the conversation down like um you know it's at the end of romans 8 for who he foreknew he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son and then you know someone will you know, hit back with a verse that seems to say the opposite. And it's like, whosoever will may come, right? Anyone who calls the name of the Lord, they'll be saved. And I think that obviously I, if you're under, if you're familiar with the theological categories, I land more reformed in my soteriology, meaning I believe God is sovereign over salvation. God initiates um, whatever that, you know, whatever that initial, um, you know, impetus for a salvific response is. I think that's in the hand of God, and he initiates it. The question is why? Does he initiate it just because it's his plan, or does he initiate it because of who he knows is going to respond to him? And that's that's where you... It's not predestination or free will. It's predestination. It's in the Bible. Uh, but what is it based on? Is it based on God's just pleasure in choosing some and not choosing others or is it based on God's foreknowledge of who will respond if he does choose them um and so I guess in that would be maybe some would say free will is is present in the latter but then missing in the former but it's look uh guys much smarter than us have been trying to figure this out for a really really long time and um uh yeah so what hill do you die on for a church? Mm. You know, like, so essentially, That's a great like, question, like, like, and and that was one of the Grace podcasts we were they were talking about it, and he he was just talking about different things that, and and I've I gotta I gotta decide it every day as a quote unquote influencer, you know, because I'm waiting for it. They'll they're they're and maybe it doesn't come. Maybe there doesn't come a moment where I need to where I stand up and they put me on this this platform, it's like, all right, tell us what you think. And I say this, this, and this, and it gets me canceled or whatever, whatever. Like, I know the hills that I just try to go with my gut every day. Yeah, when you read the, like, when Paul writes to different churches that are living in incredibly, you know, pagan cities, he always uses this idea of wisdom, or it's like, you know, shrewd as a serpent and innocent as a dove. It's like, and it's not to, you know, you don't need to, to dumb down, what you believe, you don't need to, you know, uh, I get uh, water down is the phrase I was looking for, not dumb down, but if you don't want to water down what you believe. But I think that there is a wisdom in, um, 
there is a wisdom in knowing uh, time and place for certain conversations, you know? Like um, if somebody wants to, you know, come up off of the street and be like, hey, what, what do you believe about, you know, the Bible's view of sex or marriage or gender or something like that? And it's like, you know, I, I, in no relationship do you begin the relationship with the most difficult, complicated things to, to, to right. try to wrap your mind around. So why, why are we forced to start our relationship? In no other relationship do you start the relationship by having a conversation on who you think people can and can't sleep with. And it's like, I just, I, I understand that there are, and I have, I, I, I am, I, I hold to orthodox, historic Christian beliefs about all of those things. I'm a Bible guy. I believe in every word of the Bible is true. I believe in the literal resurrection of Jesus. I believe in the literal return of Jesus coming. So I'm, I'm a Bible guy. I'm going to give Bible answers for all of those things. And yet at the same time, it's like, I, I, um, if possible, I want to create, I know that there's a way to answer the question that shuts down the relationship and I don't want to do that yet. Right. And so I'm not going to lie and I'm not going to dodge but I do want to try to be wise. And I think I think I would say the same thing to an influencer, or to a business owner. It's like be wise. There's you don't want to intentionally shut down conversations if you don't have to, or shut down opportunities if you don't have to. Obviously, uh, if you have to choose between being, you know, loved by the world, um, and being unfaithful to Jesus, or uh, being faithful to Jesus and rejected by the world then you go with Jesus every single time. Right. Um, every single time. But I do think that there's room and there's space to... Yeah, because... And 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 I think evidence of, of, of what you just said, it's like I've got friends that I disagree with. Mm-hmm. Like I've got friends that, that you know... And, and you and I have mutual friends that you and I disagree with. Mm-hmm. Had we started those friendships with the hardest question possible... Right. We probably wouldn't have ended up being friends, but now all of a sudden, the fact that that we're friends and we've 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 nurtured a relationship with those people, we can disagree but still continue a relationship because you've built something that can handle the disagreement, right? And you know you know their story, you know where they're from, you've you know maybe you've lost people together, and mm. and there there are these kind of basic experiences that we all share as humans and part of what relationships are is is uniting around those those basic experiences and i think the yes to your point it's like because there was something there before the disagreement you i think maybe one of the hardest things about the last 18 years is losing relationships over disagreements and thinking oh i thought i thought what we had could withstand that like I thought we had built enough together to kind of fall on different sides of this and yet still kind of move together yeah. arm in arm. And uh, that's a really, uh, it's a really difficult thing, you know, whether it's you know people in church or friendships or family or whatever. And so I think that that, where I find well, myself right now is like, let's, whatever it takes to kind of get back to, to trying to cultivate those kinds of things, it's, it's worth it, you know? Well, and it's like they, they died on a smaller hill than what you were willing to die on. And I think that that's part of what, part of what, you know, there's a question about what does it mean to die on a hill? Does it mean, I don't know that I would ever, I don't know that I would ever be the one pushing someone else out, you know, unless it was, I don't know. The hills yeah, that yeah, die at on some are point, just like, like the, right. I get what you're saying. I'm, I, I don't want to take the analogy too far because even if they say like, well, I don't believe that Jesus is coming back or that Jesus was, well, like you still need to be a friend with that person sure. and you still need to love that person. But if they I, say, if you, if you keep believing this, I'll never talk to you again. Right. You know that. Yeah. And, and they're the one drawing the line and it's like, you know, the thing, which is are, a rare occasion. Sure. That sure. That doesn't happen just all the time. Right. But I would, the answer is there are, there are things to, there are certainly hills to die on. There's right. a, you know, um, that if you, if you aren't convicted about anything, then, or if you're quiet about your convictions, look, if you don't believe something that costs you something, you don't believe anything worth believing. And so if it doesn't come to a point where, and it may, I'm not contradicting myself, I think I'm offering the other side of it. It's like, there's, 
Yes. I think that there is a need for Christians in this moment to be incredibly empathetic, to be incredibly humble, to not think we have all questions answered and that we're, you know, we're God's gift to the world. There's a need for that. And then there's also a need to not lose faith or lose confidence that what we know to be true is true and to stand on that even if it, it if you have to continue to pay a price for it. Somewhere in between those two things is a really good answer. <laughs> Well, that kind of answers my question of like how a guy should move forward in 2021. Like what's the hope? Because it's like even both sides are like all all different sides. I don't want to say there's just two of them, but it's just There's like, a proverb that says it's I think it's Proverbs 15:16. It's probably not cuz I'm bad with the numbers and they weren't originally there by the way. So The numbers in the the books and The numbers and scriptures the, uh, and stuff. I know the, I know the book titles, but <laughs> Proverbs, I think it's 15:16. It says, he who states his case first seems right until another comes and examines him. In other words, uh, if, if, the only, if you're only hearing one voice, that's going to be a really convincing voice. And then when you hear another voice come and challenge that voice, then it adds a level of complexity to it. And it seems like with so many of the things that, that we've been arguing about, and by we, I just mean our culture the last 18 months, especially what Christians have been arguing about, is they are speaking with a kind of clarity and a kind of certainty about things that are actually really complex and that require a lot of nuance. And so I think the way forward is to be really loud where the Bible is really clear and where God is really clear and to be really humble and curious where it's not and to not be so certain in areas where there's actually a tremendous amount of uncertainty. And then it sounds super trite or 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 cliche, I guess, but just to keep the main thing, the main thing, you know, it's like, uh, I have wondered often about my own life and about the lives of those around me. How much better would we be, um, if we had spent as much time in our Bibles as we do in the comments section on some social media yeah. posts, uh, how, what if all of the energy we spent to talking about what's wrong with everyone else around us, what if that energy was spent towards, searching our own hearts, what sin lies there, bringing it to the cross for mercy and grace. And so I, I just think one of the <laughs> one of the fundamental truths of Christianity is that I am always my biggest problem. I, my biggest problem is going to always be me. You see Paul doing that. The later that Paul gets in his writings, the stronger he is about his own sin. He says that in early on in his writings, he says he's the least of the apostles. And then later on, he says he's the chief of sinners. So of all the sinners, I'm like captain of the sin team. He says, of all the sinners, I'm the worst one out there. And it's not because he got worse and worse as a person. It's that the closer he got to Jesus, the clearer eyes he had on his own problems and areas where he needed grace. And it's like, we we need to, uh, whatever that is, we need to return to that to say, my, the thing I'm most, the biggest problem about today are going to be the problems that are that are mine and the greatest need I need is the greatest need I have is not for God to fix everyone around me that I'm just so convinced is so messed up, but for God to continue giving me grace. And then out of that grace, I'll be able to see clearly um, the needs around me. So what? What's a what's a uh, a day for you? You've already got your sermon. That's nailed down. Like just your personal time with the Lord. So, for instance, I, on vacation, what would you yeah. have done? Yeah. This last week, I um, I have been trying to grow in gratitude, grow in giving thanks. Um, there, We've been, uh, at our church, we've been going through the Psalms, and one of the things I noticed in the Psalms is that there are lots of different Psalms about a lot, a lot of different things. There are Psalms about, you know, depression, and Psalms about sin, and Psalms about salvation, but in almost every single psalm, there is a refrain of gratitude, of thanksgiving. Even in psalms that are difficult, even in psalms that are like, God, where are you? There's usually at least a tone of God, thank you. And I have, I, in studying that, I have just realized how um, gratitude is something I think I acknowledge is important, but it's actually absent from my day-to-day -day life. And so I've been trying to grow in gratitude. And I spend a lot of time on vacation just talking about with God about things that I'm grateful for, things that you've done, trying to remember my life back through a lens of gratitude. You didn't have to do this, God, but you did. And you've done it over and over again. So that's usually reading a psalm and writing a prayer and then um, reading some other things. Yeah, I you, you gave me a pretty good one, a, a good way to like study. So it was like, I'm trying to remember exactly. 
it's like read a read a passage, read a chapter, a couple of chapters, do a study, sit quietly for five minutes, turn on a timer. Yeah. Try not to think about anything. Right. Just try to like maybe even turn the lights off. I have to turn the lights off. After you get done with that five minutes, write down everything that comes to mind in mm-hmm. order. Mm-hmm. Whether it's something from family, work, something in your mind, something whatever from the past, future, and then throw it away. Remember that? Mm-hmm. Did you remember telling me that? And then, uh, anyways, I did that over and over for, it was it's a pretty, it, I don't know, I felt like it was a healthy little exercise. Yeah, I think, um, or you, you know, read something, set a timer, and then in that time, you kind of write down everything that comes to mind. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to just be mindful of the things that are kind of top of mind. It's, um, I've got a mentor who talks about it. Like when you, if you ever pour like a really frothy beer into a mug and you've got like the first inch of it is just foam, you know, if it's like a IPA or like a lager or something like that. And nobody, nobody pours the beer for the foam. You pour the beer for the drink, but you got to get through the foam at some point to get down to the drink. And so you either, slush it away or you drink through it and um for maybe our listeners who aren't quite there maybe a root beer a frothy root beer anyway um the point is is that when you are um when you're spending time with god you have to get through the foam and part of that timer is trying to get through the things that are top of mind because a lot, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll stop and like, okay, I'm going to pray. And then you think about all the things that you have to do or you could be doing instead of praying. And you only get to the foam and then you rush out before you actually get to the depth of, of time with God. And so what you're trying to do is you're trying to clear the foam so Dude, you can actually sit and spend time with God. The the My best to-do lists that I have in my phone come from like times where I'm either trying to do a Bible study or I'm literally in church. <laughs> like, Dude, I'll think of like 83 different things that I need to get done that day or week, and I'll just put them in my – I try to put them in – that way I just can stop thinking about them. Yeah. But it's like – anyway. Um, there's so many different questions I have. This is one that you and I have talked about before. It was something my old man talked about that I don't have. But he said that the devil can't hear your thoughts. Mm. God can. And you can, but the devil can't, is not like in your mind. Hmm. Can you talk to that? Speak to that. Yeah, I mean, so Satan is not omnipresent. He doesn't have the same attributes of God. Um, So, now there is something about, though, that um, there, I do think that there is, Like, the Bible will also talk about Satan as a lion who roars around, right? And he's seeking to devour. To First s- Peter? Yeah, to steal, kill, and destroy. And so I don't think he can hear your thoughts. Um, but there is an enemy, and there are there is a kind of a dark He, he might know what you're going to think before you think it. Or I think because he's so smart about you. I think what you can do is C.S. Lewis, uh, who wrote Screw Tape Letters, which is great, uh, and it talks about it's a it's well go check it out. But he says there's two errors that we make with the with spiritual things with angels and demons, or specifically with the demonic. That one error is you say that there's a demon under every rock, right? Um, meaning the de- like the devil made me do it, right? It's all kind of you give them almost maybe more power than what they have. The other side is is that they don't exist at all, and that's uh, the so you can either give too much credit or you can you can be unmindful of it altogether and so i think the thing that i i don't know the bible is actually really quiet about the specifics of how all that works the the thing to remember is that um there god has an enemy and whatever it looks like and however much power it has it wants to ruin you wants to ruin your life wants to ruin your confidence in God and in salvation, wants to ruin your marriage, wants to ruin your children. And so if you think about those things that it wants to do, it wants to steal and kill and devour. So I think that 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 there is a um, 
righteous response that says, I, I don't necessarily know what influence this is, but I want to be able to name what's of God and what's not of God so that I can pursue the things of the Lord. Does that make sense? And so if I'm thinking a thought that sounds like something that would dishonor God, or if I'm thinking a thought that would maybe call into question like God's love for me or something like that, I don't necessarily have to know that that's, I don't necessarily have to say, oh, that must be a demon or whatever, but I can at least say that's the kind of, that's the kind of thing that, that they want. And that's the kind of thing that, that, that would lead me further from God. And so I want to, yeah. Yeah. I have one or two more. Y'all have any questions? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's it's really cool just to <clears throat> hear. How do I deal with being depressed? Mm. Um I would say it depends on what kind of depression um or the degree of depression. Um when the Bible talks about things like depression and anxiety, um, there is there are very clear commands, right? If Jesus is talking about, and obviously the depression and anxiety are different, but in Matthew 19, you know, Jesus in in the Sermon on the Mount, not Matthew 19, Matthew 6, starting in 19, talks about where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Therefore, I tell you, don't be anxious about your life, what you'll eat, what you'll drink, about your body, what you'll put on. They're very clear commands, right, where he's saying there's a normative kind of anxiety and worry that you can have, but trust God. I think that there's a, so I said all that to say this, that with depression and anxiety, those kinds of things, there's a spectrum, and there's a way in which those things can be issues of sin, where it's like I'm, uh, I feel the way I feel because I am uh, worrying in a sinful way about things that God tells me not to worry about. But there's also an end where it's suffering. It's not sin. It's There's a suffering of the mind, right, where it's like if you have a broken arm and need a cast. So there's a kind of anxiety. There's a kind of depression, which is a suffering of the mind, and it, it, need, it requires a different kind of help, right? So I say that because the question, what do I do if I'm depressed, it just— in a lot of ways, it depends on, on the degree of that depression. Maybe what you need is a doctor who's going to offer help through medicine and stuff like that. You definitely need Jesus, right? There's no answer where you need less than Jesus. Whatever process is going to start with, stay with, and end with end with Jesus. But I would say that, that there are, especially Christians, there's a way in which people have a very severe battle with a mental illness, and yet they think it is sin to seek help like from a doctor or from a counselor because they think if I just had more faith, this would go away, and that's just not true. Um, it's more complicated than that. Um, but I think that for everyone, if they're feeling like a sadness or a depression, I think the first thing to do is to know that God wants to talk to you about it. God wants to hear about it. I think it is, it is so easy if I'm feeling depressed to believe that God is far from me because of that. And I need to, and God has moved from me, and that's why I feel like He's gone, and that's why I feel alone. And so, one of the simple things to do is just to pray and to tell God, just be honest. You see this all over the Psalms, being honest about uh, how people are feeling and where people are at, and then trusting God with that honesty. So, a good Psalm to uh, to pray through in that is Psalm forty two and forty three. It's a Psalm of, about by a guy who's in spiritual depression, and he talks about that's that's the psalm where it says, "As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for you." And that's uh, it sounds that sounds very like, "Oh man, I'm so into God. I want to you know drink more of water." I guess is it? Yeah, ten, forty two, ten. Be still, and know that I'm God. Is that Psalm? Psalms forty two, ten. Isn't that what that says? Let's look it up. Let's do it. Um, no, forty two, ten. It's as with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Yeah, it's about the, same, it's thing. Pretty the same thing. Yeah, yeah. pretty much the You're same just thing. You're paraphrasing it, right? Hold on. I know it's 42.10. Hold on. Be still and know that I am God. Psalm 46.10. 4610. Oh, yeah, so dang. Four, 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 four nine. Nine. That's yeah. my bad. Bet something on it. <sighs> yeah, I'm not going to bet. 
I'm not going to bet you on that. Um, I had another That's question. a really oh. important question, the one that whoever asked that. Right. Yes, it is. And I thought there may have been someone else. Yeah. No, that is an important question. That's why I wanted to ask it. Um, Bible says to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So um, when it says to work it out, I guess in my mind, faith to me, I mean, you would think it's either something you have or you don't have. Yeah. So it's something you need to work on. Mm -hmm. Like just talk a little bit about working on faith. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's like this. Imagine that you show up to A&M and you're a freshman and you go to your very first class and the president of the university is there and he says, he hands you a diploma and it says Dale Brisby, Bachelor of Arts in Ranch Management or whatever you got. And, uh, you haven't taken a class. You haven't taken a test. You haven't, you didn't even pay tuition yet. Let's say that. And he says, I'm going to cover the cost of your education. Here's your, here's your bachelor's degree. And now what I want you to do is I want you to take your classes, study for your tests and write the papers and do the projects and all that. But at that point you're doing it as a graduate. You're doing it not for something, but from something. Now, the evidence, though, that, that, that you have that degree is that you're working it out as a college student. You're going to the classes. You're, the difference is, is the, the, it is from a place of identity and uh, from a place of what's been accomplished for you already, and now it's coming out in your life on the other side. So it's, it's backwards to the way that we work. It's like I work and work and work, and then I become something. And with Jesus, it's you become something. You're declared something. And then from the place of grace and accomplishment that he's done for you, 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 you go on to work those things out. It's the, but it's still Jesus. It's the, I think there is, um, there is a hesitancy in the Christian life to assume that effort must mean earning and it doesn't effort. There's a, there's kind of a, this is what Matt would say. There's a kind of grace driven effort that it's, you're trying and you're working but it's not because your salvation's on the line. It's because you have something that's being worked out in your life. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. I like that. I'm glad, Donnie. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all redheads got to stick together. <laughs> yeah. What, um, are there times, like as a pastor, as a, like you're, you're leading a church, where where you're just like why? Oh yeah, oh yeah. You know, um, there is, uh, yeah. You know, there's something about ministry where you. Uh, my dad had a pastor friend who uh, he pastored a church down the road, and he got a job uh, running a um, truck. It was like for a construction company. He worked, he worked on Saturdays, and he ran like a lift. And uh, one day, my dad ran into him after his he worked his job, and he's dirty and sweaty. And he said, what would you do today? And he just said, I moved rocks all day with this truck. And my dad asked him, why do you do that? And he said, because at the end of the day, I can look, and I can say there was a pile of rocks there, and I moved that pile of rocks over there. And it just feels good to have accomplished something that you can see. And this is not just true for ministry, but so much of life is you are investing into a work that you just don't get to see the immediate results of or see the immediate fruit of. And in that kind of um, waiting, it's really easy to forget that this is actually about Jesus and not about me. It's really easy to feel like none of it matters, that it's just that it's um, putting in all this work and there's really no fruit from it. And so... Um, the every single Christian needs to believe this. I think it's especially true for, for pastors and ministers that the goal is actually not outcomes. The goal is obedience, that God has not trusted me with the outcomes or determining the outcomes. He's just asked me to obey. And so the win is obedience. The job well done is that, that I was faithful. 
and in seasons <clears throat> of uh, difficulty, that's the that's the that's the first thing that you forget, you know. Um, but m- more than the why is the more than the why am I doing this? Truly, is the God? Why do you let me do this? Like, it's just a joy to be about God's work. It's a joy to be God's servant. Um. So I think there's a lot of people like searching for hope. There's a lot of people out there that just like things going on in their life, and it's a big internet, and it's not policed. And when it is policed, it's not policed very well. And nobody's really policing this, but like whether it's the internet or just you're going into a church, like how do you decipher? Give it like you're you're talking to someone who is interested, who maybe they're a new believer or they're just curious about Christianity. How do you decipher like who is preaching a good word and who is mm, not? Mm, mm. If if you are only hearing things that make you feel good, I would be really cautious. If you hear a word and you're always the hero of the story, I'd be really cautious. If you're hearing a word and it sounds very similar to something you could hear from someone who doesn't believe what Christians believe, I'd be really cautious. Look, right now the popular thing is to, um, is this is a, a broad term, but a lot of prosperity preaching where it's like, you know, you're going to seize your destiny and you're going to be the, the you know, um, it's like every... Right now you're breaking, but all breaking leads to a breakthrough. Right now you're in a valley, but every valley is comes before the mountain. And it's like, it, that's just a baptized version of like the really popular message that's around us. And the message of, of Jesus is is um, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. And there's a reality to the world where not every breaking leads to a breakthrough. Some things are broken and just stay broken until yeah. Jesus comes back. Absolutely. Not every valley leads to a mountain. I've got a little brother who was born with spina bifida. He's never been able to walk. And he will, outside of supernatural healing, he will not be able to feel the weight of his body under his legs until Jesus comes back. What is he going to hear? Your breaking is about to lead to your breakthrough? That's just an empty, hollow message to someone who knows real suffering. And yet right now, because there is so much hopelessness, it's like there are a lot of guys who are just trying to build a platform by being peddlers of a really cheap, empty hope. And I, I, if... If you're not listening to a preacher, if you're not involved in a church that's going to be real about and honest about how difficult life is and then make you or invite you to be honest about the needs that you have. If Tim Keller says it this way, if um, if you believe in a God that never challenges you, then you have made yourself your own God. And the idea is that there should be something about like The whole point of the Christian life is, yes, Jesus saves us and loves us right where we are. The whole point of the Christian life is to become like Jesus. The great aim of any Christian's life is that I'm conforming into the image of God's Son. And that requires a lot of repentance. That requires a lot of being challenged. That requires us, you know, being in environments where the the idols that we've clung to, someone's going to pry our hands off of those so that we can have more space yeah. To receive from God. So, yeah, there's a lot out there. There's a lot of things that sound really good out there. <laughs> if the message does not center on or end with Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and uh, someday return, then uh, I would go find something else to listen to. Yeah. Man, it's like sometimes I just don't know if... Like, God, I hope this is you mm. telling me that this person is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Mm. Because I feel, I like, I'll just get mad. And I don't know if it's me mm. just being, you know, like, cynical or, like, just, so, I, sometimes I don't think it is. Sometimes I know, like, hey, this person is not, like, this sounds good, but... It's just, anyway, whatever. Well, and I think, too, it's like... I just experienced a couple of things, like, online just recently. Just just saw a few things that stirred me up. You know, I didn't go comment. I didn't go whatever, but, in, like, yesterday. Sure. And so I was just, that's why it's fresh. Well, what I'd be careful of is it's like, as somebody who who 
you know, communicates for a living. I also don't want somebody to judge an entire ministry based on a 30 second clip either, you know? So it's like, that's the thing. It's, it's, if you're really trying to get a good, a good read on someone, you need to at least give them the honor of listening to 10 sermons in its entirety. Right. To see, because it's, it's a good point. Yeah. It, no one, no one, uh, can withstand the scrutiny of, having just 30 seconds up right. there. There's a few things you can say in 30 seconds that would probably, <laughs> I yeah. mean, like, <laughs> yes, that's true. I understand what you're saying. You're, that's you're true. talking about like taking things out of context. Yeah, there's, there's a, a few way things. to use your 30 seconds where you get a really good read. Right. On, yeah. On there, what somebody's about. There's but, a few things you can yeah. say in 30 seconds that you don't need context for with a person, but I understand what you're saying too. Like, yeah, and that's, that's true of what in that's, 30 seconds. Well, I'm not going to say them cause I don't want you to take it out of context. <laughs> um, yeah, I had another question. So essentially, what we try to do? How long have we been talking? Uh, hour forty. We Ooh. got oh, oh, it's eleven fifty. So today is Friendsgiving. We do. We're gonna. We're, we're supposed to be there at noon. So that that's a good moment. We're gonna. We'll wrap up and do the intro. But um, we usually end with uh, life advice. Okay. <coughs> So think on it. Well, since you since they know this was coming, I'll start with them. We'll end with you. What's well, some life advice you got for us, Donnie? Um, I actually had a question. Oh yeah, let's um, do that. We got time. Like, um, I guess is it our responsibility, like, to try to communicate with others? Like, you're talking about like a a church, like. A, that's trying to be a business with a cheap sale. Is it our responsibility to communicate with others that that's not good and you shouldn't go there? Like, So I would think the first question to ask is, do I have the relationship with this person to be able to say this thing? So I don't think it's your responsibility to like show up at that church with a sign and yeah. convince people not to come. Yeah. Right? I know yeah. that's not what you're asking. Yeah. but Yeah, if there's someone that you love and care about and you just say, hey, I, I think that there's – if you've done your homework, you know, and you've checked the person or place mm-hmm. out and you're pretty convinced, hey, this is not where you're going to. But that's what love is in all of our relationships. Mm-hmm. It's like I there's a definition for love that we use at our church that love is I am with you and for you, even and especially when it's hard because I want my life to make your life look more like Jesus. It's a long definition, but that's what love is. I'm with you and I'm for you uh, in the in the the hope I have. I have this. I have this dream for you that you're going to look more like Jesus. And I, I want to be a part of, of helping that. Mm-hmm. And so if what that means for some is, hey, I, I think that this person you're listening to, I think that this influence is actually not contributing to you flourishing and looking like Jesus. Um, and I think that there's wise ways to, hey, I, I know that you really love that this person said this. Here's another sermon that I'd love for you to consider. Here's another, you know, the other side of that that I want you to consider, maybe we can talk about it together, you know, but yeah, I do think that there's, depending on the relationship, I do think that there's a responsibility to, to help. Yeah. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. And knowing how is super hard. Yeah. 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 Not just being like, don't go like (laughs) without shoving it down their throat. (laughs) Yeah. Um, is it Dale? No. <laughs> Maybe, but we won't say that on this podcast. Um, uh, I guess my life advice would be um, good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. So, mm. like, Willie, um, question or advice? I guess this would be my advice. I got to make sure I say it right. To be in the world, but not of the world. Mm. I like that a lot, especially being introduced to all this social media stuff. I think it's important to remember, especially because he touched on I thought he was going to say it. Like, you can still, like, if you have to choose between everyone loving you or hating you, make sure you're doing the right thing. And in the end, I think the people that really care the most about you are still going to be there with you if you have to make that difficult decision. So if you had to make that difficult decision to be canceled, I think the people that still care about you would still be there supporting you, but... Going back to my advice, yeah, be be in the world, but not of the world. Yeah, I like that. You know, it's like you you definitely, there's been times where you have to stand alone 
like in your walk and in, in just everyday life. Um, and somebody said once they, you know, that, um, is a guy that, you know, like I, I really get more business advice from, you know, he's not, he's not a pastor, but he, uh, he talked about like how he doesn't care what anybody really thinks about him outside of those closest to him. You know, it's like, and, and I think that the, the advice was like somebody in the comments section, they don't even know you, you know? And so like, if, if your wife or your dad or your brother or your best friend is like, Hey man, there's this stuff going on that you need to change. Anyway, that's a pretty, but there's, there's, there's times too when you might have to, you stand alone, even in that circle, Mm -hmm. you know, and like, you've got a, it's just like, you believe this thing and your, your, your family, your, your tight, your inner circle believes differently and you got to stand alone in that circle. But being in the world and not of the world is, couldn't be really any more applicable today than any other time. Um, when life hands you lemons, put a bull rope on them. And also read your Bible every day. I've been kind of, I've been really like listening to John Piper. There was one of those, he was talking about like how it's like, you need to be in your Bible. Like, like, and how, how much, like he talked about like how much he's in it even today. And I, and when you think of somebody like that, it's just like, they know so much about the Bible. They could probably skip a day. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I know how little I know about it. And I skip plenty of days, Mm -hmm. how much more he knows, but he's still in it every day. And so that's where even someone like, like yourself or Matt, like you guys know the Bible that much and you're still, I just don't know the numbers. Yeah. (laughs) Books only. But man, it would be anyway, people start asking you questions. It's like, how long you've been a Christian? You don't know the answer to this question. Like you don't have a scripture ready for me, you know? That's that's where lately I've I've felt convicted, I'd say. Mm. So but I've I've been doing it. I've been getting more in the Bible night and morning. So I'll get mad whenever my streak breaks on my Bible app. Get a little streak <laughs> going. Son, I'll get I was so What I, do you use? Just the Bible app. Okay. Golly, I feel I get annoyed when they ask me to review it. I don't really have time. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, God, I need to write this review for the Bible that I have yet. Yeah, and how can you give the Bible any less than five stars? Exactly. Right? They, they've yeah. got to have the best reviews <laughs> on the iTunes app, on the app store. Um, but, yeah, my granddad died a couple years ago, and it broke, like, the longest streak I'd had. You know, just had, like, a busy day of, like, mourning my granddad, and I didn't get on my Bible app. Mm. And uh, it's like, gosh darn it, Papa. <laughs> <laughs> I had a good streak going. You had to go and mess it up. <laughs> Dying on us. Oh, man. Anyways. <laughs> What's your life advice? Hmm, this has been something I've thought about a lot. So it's probably just the life advice of the moment. But there is more to be grateful for than there is to worry about. I'm trying to be mindful of that lately. Also, uh, if you're not watching and rooting for the Dallas Mavericks, then you're missing out. Mm. It's their year. I'm going to go to... Uh, I think I'm going to go to a Mavericks game. Really? When? Um, it's in January. Okay. I'm going to probably be wearing a, 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 a different jersey, though. Who's your team? It'll be the Orlando Magic. I- <laughs> Boston <laughs> Celtics. Jonathan Isaac. You know the – he's a he, – he plays for him. Okay. Anyway, he's a, he's a pretty strong Christian – Pretty outspoken on social media, has a couple of nonprofits. Anyways, we just buds? we're d- Instagram buds. Okay, and he invited me to a game. Nice. It was, dude. It made my month. Uh huh. Like I was like over the moon about it. Every now and then, he when he watches my story, like dude, I'm like, I'm so pumped. Well, it's I'll like go a, with you. But and I'll wear a match jersey. I'll probably wear. I probably won't wear a jersey. Okay. I'll probably just wear. I'm. A, I'm gonna be secretly rooting for my boy Jonathan. Okay. So, anyway. Um, but I do, I'm a big Luca fan. He's great. He's the man. Like, that's a, that's a baller. I love me some basketball too much. Have you been watching him for real? Yes. Nice. I, I watch a lot that. of basketball. Okay. Like, too much. Well, now we have something to talk about. Yeah. Like, that's, it's like rodeo pops up and then basketball in my news feed. Like, 
it, the algorithm has found out how much I enjoy the NBA. The warehouse got quiet. Everybody left. So um, everybody go look up uh, Jamin Roller on Instagram. We're going to make him a celebrity preacher. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just kidding. I don't I'm have just kidding. If you, if, you, um, if you go look up Jamin Roller on Instagram, I'm sure somewhere he's tagged Matt Chandler. Go follow Matt Chandler. <laughs> <laughs> they already are. And uh, anyways, thank you all for listening. Uh, DM Jamin. Any questions you have, um, look up Citizens Church if you're in Plano. Come on. And uh, go listen to a sermon. And um, we're you, you, you're not playing our outro music. Looks like we are on to the next one. Or are we on to the next one? Oh, yeah. And we're <laughs> on to the next one. <laughs> Text podcast to 940 350 0890. If you want to hear when the podcast drops.